Hey, my name is Max Hockstein. I am an emergency physician and intensivist here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in Act in Two Parts, uh, we will be discussing end tidal capnography. So when we talk about end tidal, uh, there's this weird vocabulary that goes along with it. Is it capnometry, capnography? Are we using colorimetry? Are we using volumetry? Uh, after today, my hope is that you will have uh, a more concrete idea uh, of what we are talking about uh, when we use end tidal. So why should we do this? Well, there are really two things that we learn uh, about when we use end tidal, uh, about minute ventilation and also a little bit about cardiac output. So uh, this is a very important model and to appreciate the finer points of end tidal, uh, we should revisit uh, the idea of VQ matching. So if V denotes ventilation and Q denotes capillary blood flow because of some semi-convenient facts about the lung structure. Not all alveoli have the same VQ ratio. So some lung regions have higher VQ and some have lower VQ matching. So lungs with more ventilation uh, or lung units with uh, higher ventilation have a lower CO2 and lungs with a higher Q have a higher PCO2. So if you think way back uh, to when you first learned pulmonary physiology, uh, we can recall that CO2 is a perfusion limited gas. So really all you need to get uh, CO2 into the alveoli is blood flow to the alveoli. One way of thinking about this is that perfusion to the alveoli raises PCO2 and ventilation lowers it. This lends itself to a relatively attractive concept uh, that end tidal capno is really like a cheap arterial line uh, with its value proportional to right heart output. So this also lends to another fact about VQ matching, and it's important to note uh, that not all of the respiratory tree has the same amount of Q. That is to say, not all of the respiratory tree has the same amount of blood flow. The consequence to this is dead space. So if you think about the numerical gap between the end tidal value and the PCO2 value, uh, it's approximately uh, proportional to dead space, which is to say that your end tidal value will be less than your arterial value, which will be less than your uh, PACO2 uh, that you may get on your blood gas. So the normal end tidal gradient, that is to say the value you get on your uh, end tidal capno and your blood gas should be anywhere less than 5 millimeters. So how does this work? So the way that uh, modern end tidal works is by non-dispersive infrared absorption. Uh, and this is actually a pretty simple concept with a fancy name. So a beam of infrared light is passed through a gas that your patient exhales. Uh, and the resulting intensity of the transmitted light uh, is then directed to a photodetector. So fun fact, uh, CO2 absorbs light around 4.26 micrometers. Uh, and as more CO2 is present in the exhaled gas, less infrared uh, is absorbed at this wavelength, uh, and therefore less will get to the detector. In other words, the more CO2 that's present in your patient's exhaled gas, uh, the more infrared uh, light uh, is absorbed, and this is graphically represented on the screen as the waveform that we all know and love. So what types of capnometers exist? Well, there are two in mainstream, as it were, uh, use. There is the side stream, or what you'll hear called diverting uh, capno, or mainstream, which is non-diverting. So this is the side stream model. The side stream analyzers uh, is probably the most commonly used in all of clinical practice. So side stream analyzers have a pump or a compressor, and what it does is it will aspirate the gas uh, into a sample cell uh, in your console. Uh, and to ensure that no carbon dioxide is lost, the tubing is actually made of Teflon, so it's impermeable to carbon dioxide. So as you can expect, it'll take a degree of time uh, for the exhaled gas to get to the module. This is called your transit time or your transit delay, uh, and it, which depends on the length and the diameter, that is to say the volume of the tubing. So anywhere between one and four seconds are the commonly accepted industry standards uh, for transit time. Now the rise time is the delay it takes uh, for your module to respond uh, to the change in CO2. Uh, and this really depends on the size of the uh, sample chamber and gas flow. It's usually an imperceptible difference. Uh, so with side stream analyzers, the consequence to this uh, is that your end tidal waveform won't be well synchronized with your patient's exhalation uh, as you're watching them clinically. Mainstream modules uh, are connected very close 
to the endotracheal tube, uh, and it has an infrared transducer approximating the ED tube. There's a very small increase in dead space, which is, to, is virtually forgettable. So this is uh, what we are going to see, a time capnogram. A, a scalar is anything that varies with time, and what we are looking at is how your end tidal will vary uh, with the passage of time. And so this is what your end tidal looks like, and it's potentially a little bit counterintuitive, because the part that increases is the exhalation portion, the part that decreases is the inhalation portion. So let's go through these phase by phase. So this is phase one. Phase one corresponds to the exhalation of pure dead space gas. So this is all of the gas uh, from your central conducting airways or any equipment that is distal to your sampling site. Uh, ideally, this area or this phase should have no detectable carbon dioxide. Then we get to phase two. Uh, phase two is called the transitional phase. And what you can see here is a relatively steep rise in the waveform, uh, which represents uh, sampling from both the dead space uh, gas that we had before, as well as sampling from the alveolar gas. So you can see here that the uh, transitional phase is pretty steep. Um, and this is typically uh, when V and Q are well matched. So strictly speaking, the exhaled gas here uh, belongs to both phase one and phase three. And speaking of phase three, phase three is the plateau region of your capno. Uh, and this corresponds really to the gas that lives in the alveoli. So if all the alveoli had the same PCO2, your alveolar plateau would be perfectly flat, right? Uh, but we know that's almost never the case. There's a bunch of mixed mass in the lungs, which results in variable VQ ratios, uh, and therefore a distribution rather than a single PCO2 value. So for well-matched areas of the lung with like optimal VQ matching, the alveolar CO2 empties pretty early in the expiratory phase, and similarly, uh, less optimally matched areas empty later in your expiratory cycle. So for lungs that have a mix of optimal and suboptimal VQ matching, that is to say a lot of heterogeneity in the VQ matching, phase three will have a characteristic slope. So if you remember nothing else about phase three, uh, if you have a homogeneous lung that is well matched, you will see a flat uh, plateau of phase three. And again, phase three really just comes from the uh, alveolar gas. So now comes phase four. Uh, and not every textbook mentions this. However, there's often a waveform uh, called uh, phase four. Uh, and what you'll see here is a little bit of an upstroke called a pigtail. And this usually happens in people uh, with bad compliance. Uh, and no matter if there's a phase four or not, the end tidal value that is displayed on the screen uh, is the value that is at the peak of your end tidal waveform. It's the highest recorded value that you'll see on the tracing. Normally values are anywhere between 35 and 40. Phase zero is the decrement of the waveform, and this is, was always counterintuitive to me. So phase zero, uh, it represents inhalation, where uh, freshly inhaled gas invades the sampling site, which kind of gets rid of all of the existing CO2 that exists in the chamber. Uh, so you'll see a few authors refer to this as phase four, but most people will call this phase zero. So think phase zero uh, representing inhalation. You'll also see uh, existing in the literature something called a volume capnogram, which is not a scalar. It is really not something that varies with time, where your x-axis is, in fact, your tidal volume, and your y-axis is your end tidal value. So uh, the volume capno has a lot of utility in both the intensive care units and the emergency department, but its uptake is not yet universal. So check the manuscript at the bottom of this slide for one of my favorite references. The utility in uh, volumetric capno, uh, which is what we see here, where you have tidal volume on the x-axis instead of time, uh, is largely uh, in optimizing your mechanical ventilation settings, uh, and its interpretation requires some practice. So what about this guy here? Uh, this is a coloring. The way that this works is that it's a pH-sensitive litmus paper, uh, and it really will have three different colors on it, which corresponds to end tidal percent uh, of CO2, uh, where you have uh, yellow, uh, which is uh, the more acidic end of the pH litmus uh, paper, and you have purple. And lots of things can be acidic, lidocaine, carbon dioxide, epinephrine, or emesis. Uh, and so this is why it's really not all that great 
uh, as a detector to be uh, have, of a confirmation of tracheal intubation. So there's a lot of times where you should be using end tidal. Uh, from the time the endotracheal tube goes in until the endotracheal tube comes out. Uh, during resuscitation, preload responsiveness, and in fact during conscious sedation to detect apnea. It is standard of care to use continuous waveform capnography to confirm endotracheal uh, intubation. So it should be done in every single patient that gets intubated. We should stop it with the colorimetry. Uh, this was from an article in 1990 citing 62 intubations where this device performed well. No other study has ever had colorimetry uh, outperform a waveform capnography. This is probably one of my favorite uh, metrics uh, for resuscitation. Uh, think of end tidal like a cheap A-line. It can be used with any airway. Uh, it can look for a good CPR. It, can even prognosticate arrests if your end tidal is persistently less than 10. Uh, so this looks for return of spontaneous circulation uh, because, as we've said before, think of your end tidal capno like a cheap A-line. Uh, if all of a sudden it increases, you should uh, evaluate for the return of spontaneous circulation, or it's because uh, your patient was unfortunately given sodium bicarbonate, which was metabolized to carbon dioxide. There's also a little bit of literature that uh, looks at the uh, ability for end tidal to predict preload responsiveness, uh, where you can see with a passive leg raise, uh, the sweep speed was increased, uh, was decreased, uh, and the end tidal value increased um, with preload responsiveness. A greater uh, value of greater than five percent uh, will I indicate a preload response. So that was it for Act One. Uh, now for intermission, and I look forward to seeing you in Act 2.